good afternoon everyone so hopefully you can you can hear us well see the see the presentation see the presentation uh, i would like to welcome you today to this uh, to this short uh, webinar where we would like to talk about uh, explainable artificial intelligence uh, and its use in uh, in pricing in insurance pricing if we would just quickly look at the look what we would like to go through today uh, on, on the on the agenda uh, basically what, what we would like to, to walk you through is really the theory behind explainable AI so so that you understand the different uh, uh, different methods uh, what business impacts they might have what 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 are the pros and cons and usage of the uh, of of uh, each of the methods, um, then uh, and then we will actually have like a practical part so that you actually see how the application of the methods looks in uh, in a real real life tool. So in we have uh, Mikolai from from Quanti with us who will who will present how the methods are basically implemented and how they look like and how they can bring insight into uh, into the into the models in in their in their tool quanti and throughout the throughout the presentation uh, we will also be asking some questions to you through through slido so we don't have that many questions we have we have three questions that poll questions that will be that are anonymous and that will pop up on the on the screen but if you if you basically scan this scan this qr code or or then later you you input the the code into slido.com uh, you will be able to one see the see the see the polls and two you will be able to basically ask any questions or write down any questions that pop up uh, in your mind during the during the during the presentation uh, and at the end we will we will be answering and you can also vote for other people's Question. So, if you think that the question is that the question is good, that it's something that interests you, you can also vote the vote the question up so that, that there is more chance that uh, we will then answer them at the end of the at the end of the webinar. To introduce the the presenters for for today, uh, it will be um, shortly introduced by uh, by myself. I'm a senior manager in in Deloitte in the in the Prague office. Uh, I have worked in uh, in insurance as, a, as an actuary since uh, 2000, uh, 2011, uh, focusing on on variety of of projects from solvency to IFRS 17 to to pricing projects, and uh, then the actual crux of the presentation or the meat of the presentation will be will be delivered by uh by uh two colleagues uh patrick liptag who is uh who is a manager in also in the uh prague office of uh of deloitte uh patrick has uh has over five years experience in uh in deloitte he's focusing on uh on actual modeling uh predictive modeling data visualization so uh very very knowledgeable in in these kinds of field and and i think he's also the first one in czech republic to be cera certified uh uh CERA certified member and then uh last but not least we have uh Mikolai from uh from quanti uh Mikolai is uh an actual pricing consultant at quanti and uh, has over five years of international experience uh where basically he he focuses on uh, on uh, actual pricing uh, within within a quanti, and uh, I think he also likes to not only work in insurance but also use the data data science skills and also other other financial financial inst institutions. Uh, and maybe before before we jump into the uh, into the heavy. Uh, heavy theory behind behind explainable AI. I would like to give basically a few uh, words, uh, a few few motivation words. What what uh, so that so that we are all on the uh, on the same same track. Basically, what what we have seen in let's say the past uh, 
century, so going going back quite fast, quite 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 a lot, is that a lot of statistical models that can be used for predictive purposes were have been developed. Those are basically including linear models, GLM, uh, GLMs, trees, etc. But with the increasing number of available data sets and also the increasing computational power, uh, the demand for better predictive uh, models has, basic, has, has emerged. And better predictive models uh, also maybe means that these are predictive models that are assembled from uh, from simpler models creating maybe uh, rather from trees you're looking into into forests and rather than uh, from uh, from a simple simple model you're looking into into neural neural networks and uh, although these do have uh, do have uh, greater predictive or could have greater predictive powers than using using uh, linear models, as with anything, there basically comes a, a cost to this. So if, if, there, is a, if there is a progress, there is, there is usually a cost. And these models are perceived as, uh, as, as black boxes that are very difficult to, to interpret. And if you do not use them, uh, if you do not use them carefully, you might end up like in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where basically you get, you get the answer to, to to everything which is 42 but you have no idea what it what it actually what it actually means um, and uh, so what we have seen is that basically insurers have been um, focusing or, or using mainly the so-called glass glass models for their pricing pricing needs so these are basically models that can be uh, well understood the, the outputs of these models can be can be well interpreted and this is, of course, for for good good reasons, as more and more uh, regulatory and uh, reputational requirements basically uh, require from them to uh, to explain the outcomes of of their of their pricing model, and not only not only regulatory and reputational, but also maybe uh, sales or other departments within within a company want to know why why a certain client is is maybe getting. Um, getting a, a discount and and uh, other one other one is not um and also another reason for for this is that usually the pricing actuaries have got a very huge domain knowledge in 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 the field that they have and uh, hence are are very good in working with those with those glass uh glass boxes glass boxes models um however what what this means by using the using the glass boxes is that there is some potential to uh, maybe miss a, a potentially stronger prediction prediction model, and that's where we think that basically explainable AI uh, steps in and could be could be basically used by insurance companies to get out get the best out of out of both both worlds, and we will. Come back to that towards the end end of the presentation. What what we see, uh, what we see this to to be. But uh, uh, I have, I will now basically leave the floor to to Patrick to present what 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 we actually mean by explainable AI and what 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 methods we will be we will be talking uh, talking today about. So Patrick, the word is yours. Yes. Thank you, thank you for a sweet introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, you can hear me and see me. This webinar is a little bit strange because I cannot see you and I cannot even see myself. So I hope every, everything is okay. I would like to start with a theoretical part and I will take over to Nikolai. I do not want to be very technical and mathematical. I will leave it at, uh, at the book at the university. I just want to uh, focus on intuition behind those techniques and uh, choose few of them and give you a little uh, peek how, how it works in uh, explainable AI. Okay, so let's start with uh, explainable AI methods. Uh, these methods are basically techniques for exploration and explanation of a model's prediction, either for single observations or for entire data set. 
This is why I split uh, those kind of techniques into two uh, subgroups. One is instance level. Uh, these techniques help us understand how a model yields a prediction for a particular single one observations. Uh, you can use it either to analyze how does the model's prediction for the particular instance differ from the average prediction and how uh, can this difference be distributed among experimental variables. If you take a look at the top picture, here you can see a uh, description depicted in, in the picture. Uh, so on X1 axis and X2 axis, you can see your experimental variables, for example, Darwin's age or direct location. And on the Z axis, you can see uh, values of predictions. And uh, maybe you can uh, you can uh, estimate some random forest over it, and you will get a complex, complex prediction function. And if you imagine that this grid is uh, average value or uh, mean of of your of your predictions, here you can see for this particular driver what is the contribution of x1 variable, x variable, and what is the contribution of x2 uh, x variable. And so you can see how, uh, how important they are and how they contributed to the overall prediction for one uh, single model point. Then uh, the second usage is that you can investigate how the model's prediction changed if the value of a single explanatory variable changes. You can see it in the second picture. So here, uh, what we are basically doing, uh, we are looking at the X1 explanatory variable and we are fixing X2 variable. So it's like cut through the complex function and from the two dimensional function, you are getting only one dimensional function and you can explore further what is uh, their properties and what is the curvature, slope and so on, so on and how it behaves at the end and the beginning of the function and so on and so on. The first usage is to investigate the local behavior of the function around your point of interest. This is depicted in the third picture. So here you have some complex function and you replace it by, uh, by an easier linear function around the, your point of interest. But uh, this is a little bit tougher um, uh, due, to, uh, due to lack of our webinar. I do not want to go into it. So it won't be in the scope of today's webinar. Then you can move on and you can take a look on the techniques, techniques uh, which assess uh, prediction power of model on the data set level. These techniques uh, help you to understand how the model predictions perform overall for entire set of observations, and they can be used uh, for learning which variables are important uh, in the model. So, for example, if you if you find out that some variables do not influence predictions, you could simplify the model by removing those variables. Uh, you can use it to understand how a selected variable influences the model predictions. For example, driver's location is an important factor, but you may want to know which locations lead to higher premiums. Or you can use it to discover whether there are any observations for which the model yields wrong predictions. So you can identify a group of drivers which might point to an incorrect form of an exponential variable or even a missed variable. Or you can uh, want to know overall performance of the model. But I think that you are very familiar with the fourth point. These are kind of statistics like MSE, RMSE, and so on and so on. So these two points won't be in the scope of today's webinar due to length of the webinar, but I will cover the first two points. Okay, let's begin with instant uh, level uh, methods. Uh, I will start with breakdown for additive distributions. Uh, these techniques uh, try to uh, answer the question of which variables contribute to the uh, result the most. Or if you want to take it uh, from the business point of view, you can expect some question from the product or sales uh, department and they can ask you why does this specific customer or a group of similar customers uh, need to pay so high premium and what it's what is it caused by so you can uh, decomposite models prediction into contribution that can be attributed to different explanatory variables so 
you can see one a very easy example on the right side here uh, here are some uh, explanatory variables for uh, prediction of frequency for one particular diver you can see the intercept this is the mean value across the whole portfolio so you can think of it that there is eight percent chance that uh, the driver uh, that there will be damage uh, for, for the for the average driver and you want to look at one specific driver which is 52 years old which drives across area c and give the bonus values value of 50. So you can decompose it uh, into three components, and you can see that a value of bonus values uh, improves the overall prediction for this particular driver. Also, RSC improves uh, improves the total prediction, and driver H52 versus the prediction, and the total prediction is below 6%. What are the pros and cons of this method? Uh, pros are it is easy to understand and it is the compact method. This approach reduces to an intuitive interpretation for linear models and also the numerical um, numerical requirement is also linear. So this method doesn't take a lot of time to compute. Uh, what are the cons? Uh, this method may be misleading for models including interactions. So you can see here that it catches only uh, additive contribution, but it can be uh, it can be solved through approaches that can address issue of interactions. But again, it's not in the scope of, of today's webinar. And also, this approach is appropriate for models including many explanatory variables with small contribution to the insert prediction. I'm talking about thousands of variables. But uh, in this case, you can uh, pick, let's say, three, four, five, uh, the most important ones, and you can merge contribution of all other variables to one bar. So you can make also easy graph with, uh, uh, with a few bars, uh, but the rest of not really important variables will be uh, merged into one uh, bar at the end. The second instant level method is Ceteris Paribus. It is a method that evaluates the effect of a selected explanatory variable in terms of changes of a model's prediction induced by changes in the variable's value. The method is based on the Ceteris Paribus principle. Uh, Ceteris Paribus is a Latin phrase meaning other things held constant or all else unchanged. It is really useful in what if uh, model analysis. And how it is constructed? So uh, here you have some uh, regression function f, uh, the feature vector xj, which you are interested in. For example, it can be, let's say, driver h, and the value of Ceteris paribus for a variable j, which is driver h, and observation y at point z is a uh, value of uh, regression function with fixed value of driver h. Uh, there are a lot of things going on in this formula. Let's take it step by step. So, uh, as I said, uh, J represents driver H. Observation Y, you can think of uh, your portfolio of uh, observations, and observation Y can be uh, observation number 33. And point Z is value of uh, explanatory variable you are interested in. So, for example, driver H 50. You are interested in and now you take your model you plug in uh all your uh, values with fixed age 50 and you will get your uh your prediction and this is uh this uh, uh prediction over here and now you can fix all other variables like uh, area where the drivers uh drives or uh, uh bonus models and so on and so on and you can only uh, maneuver with driver age uh, variable. So you can get a graph and you can see how the prediction uh, changes if the age uh, changes a little bit. So it's like uh, uh, it's like some of the derivation, let's say. And here you can see it better on the second picture. Uh, the X axis is age, Y axis is uh, some other explanatory variable, and Z axis is uh, again a model response. Uh, actually, what are you doing? 
you are uh, again cutting the complex uh, complex function and you are getting uh, from two dimensional function to one dimensional function and you can assess the slope and curvature of that kind of function and you can also assess the behavior at the beginning and at the end where for driver age can be uh, some problems what are pros and cons of uh, this technique uh, this technique is uh, uniform easy to communicate easy to understand graphical representation and uh, cons are that uh, analytic settings and misleading results for providing expected variables what does it mean it's not possible to keep one variable fixed while varying the other ones and also uh, this technique is an appropriate for models with hundreds or thousands of variables again as uh, for case of uh, breakdowns uh, yeah let's go to data set level methods we'll start with model agnostic variable importance or short mavi uh, this uh, method is useful for the evaluation of the importance of an explanatory variables, but for the entire data set, not for uh, one observation for entire data set. And I want to give you a little bit of intuition. So for linear models and many other types of models, there are methods of assessing explanatory variables importance that exploit particular elements of the structure of the model. These are called uh, model specific methods. For instance, for linear models, you can use value of regression coefficient of corresponding uh, good old p-values as the variable importance measure. For tree-based models, you can use measures such uh, as variable importance, which are based on a number of nodes and leaves where the variable is located. And you can, again, uh, calculate a variable importance measure, but just for the random forests. These techniques, uh is not uh restricted to one specific type of models it can be used generally for from linear models to random forest to machine learning uh models yeah and the main idea is uh, to measure how much does the model performance change if the effect of selective explanatory variable or of a group of variable is removed so let's take again driver's age and uh, let's take our model and our predictions. We can calculate those predictions either on training or test data set, and we can assess uh, value of our loss function. But now what we can do, we can permutate, permute uh, uh, driver's age across our observation. So we have some 50 years old driver and we can uh, exchange this uh this age with uh, other drivers age and the idea if the driver age is important it would lead to a worsening of situation of the loss function so if i permit uh driver's age i would uh obtain a bad uh, value of the loss function but on the other side if we have some uh, not really important variable if we permit uh their elements we could get a uh, really close value of the loss function, which, not, uh, which could not be significantly uh, different from the original value of the loss function. And uh, because we are doing some uh, permutation, it is advisable to repeat the procedure because there is a uh, risk of uh, randomness in this. So it is advisable to repeat it several times and then average uh, values of the loss function. What are the pros and cons of this technique? Pros, it is easy to understand, again, compact and easy to read. Measures can be compared between models because it can be used for different kinds of models and may lead to interesting insights. And what are the cons? Uh, Dependence on the random nature of the permutation, but you can uh, solve it uh, that you can uh, run it several times and then average it and the choice of the loss function. And last but not least, partial dependence profiles. Uh, we can recall that the 
Ceteris paribus profile shows the dependence of an instance level prediction on an explanatory variable. A partial dependence profile on the other side uh, is uh, estimated by the mean of the Ceteris paribus profiles for all instances from the data set. Um, PD profiles are useful for comparisons of different models. You can uh, check if there is agreement between profiles for different models, and it can assure you that uh, the models you are currently using are good. And if case you are using some more complex model, you can be sure that you are not overfitting the data. You can check uh, if there is any disagreement between uh, profiles which may suggest a way to improve the model. So, for example, if you check a profiles for a linear model and for a random forest, and you can see that a random forest uh, behaves differently at the beginning, that is a sign that your model do not capture those nonlinearity at the beginning of the of the spectrum of the driver's age, and so on and so on. Uh, so, if you look at the construction of partial dependence profiles, uh, you can see that it's really similar to Ceteris Paribus. Uh, the only difference is that uh, in Ceteris Paribus there is no summation and not one over n. So, what is going on here? Uh, again, you are getting uh, one dimensional fun function, uh, one explanatory variable, and prediction on the y axis. Uh, the other variables are fixed. But now you are uh, averaging about averaging over all combinations of other explanatory variables. So in uh, the old case of Ceteris Paribus, I was fixing uh, the, uh, fixing values of other explanatory variables, and I kept them like this uh, for each driver age. Now for driver age 50, I want to average prediction of through all areas, through all bonus modulus values, through all other explanatory variables. And I get one signal observation for driver H50. And uh, if I continue with the process for other driver edges, I can get uh, this uh, partial dependence profile. What are pros and cons of this technique? Again, this technique is easy to explain as it's intuitive. Uh, in a simple way to summarize the effect of a particular explanatory variable on the dependent variable, and it can be comparable across different models. Uh, cons, cons are um, inherited uh, from the uh, Ceteris variables profiles because the construction is very similar. You are now doing only average over all uh, explanatory variables. And that's it from my part. So before before we thank you, Patio, before we jump to to Mikolai's, uh, Mikolai's uh, demo, we should we uh, have the first uh, first question over at at Slido. So uh, if if uh, we would appreciate your inputs in into the into this. So again, if you either scan the QR code or you go to Slido and and input the uh, the code that you can see on the screen. You should be able to to see this see this question, which is if you think that these theoretical methods that you that you've seen now would potentially improve uh, the the usage of of these black box uh, black box models within uh, within your company, uh, or if if you if you think that uh, if you think that these uh, that these these methods basically would not uh be useful for you or would not would not bring value uh and and you would still perceive the black boxes as 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 uh, as black black boxes so we'll leave the uh we'll leave the 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 question on on the on the screen for for uh, for a while so we will then come back to the to the results at, at the end to see the full full answers because i think that in the in the meantime we can then switch to uh to Mikolai's, uh Mikolai's demo and yeah i think so um so thanks for the introduction for both of you Jakub and patrick and in this part, as uh, mentioned by Jakub, we will focus on the practical aspects of 
what Patrick has already told us today. So what, maybe a few words of introduction first. What you see on your screens right now is the pricing pipeline. So we've got an actuary who loaded the data. In this particular example, we would be looking at the French NTPL data. So first we've got some policy information um, that consists of the variables such as policy ID, some categorical variables such as area or region, as well as some numerical variables such as vehicle power, driver age, and pretty much just the description of both the policy holder and the vehicle, um, and like the customer behavior, where the customer is moving around, and uh, etc. Then we've got a second data set, which consists of slightly less variables, which is again the policy ID, claim number, and the claim total amount. So the first natural thing that we would like to do is join these data sets together and uh, combine it into some kind of risk data. And um, another important remark is that we would be looking at two risk models today. One would be a linear GLM model and the other one would be a gradient boosting method from the world of nonlinear estimators. And before we, um, before we started the webinar, we worked on the best possible GBM and GLM on the particular set of variables. So what you will see on your screen is just two models based on the test data set, just to compare those two models between themselves. We would not be looking at the train and validation data sets today. Then uh, to support the results, we've got some kind of EDA just to show you what, it's, uh, what it could look like. But again, we've done it beforehand. So maybe let's have a look at what it looks like. So we could be looking at things like histogram of a particular explanatory variable, be a bar chart, some summary of statistics, fraction of missing values, and the correlation of the variables, uh, just, just for an example of a particular EDA. And then uh, we can move on to pretty much describing the details of our GLM and GBM, and then we'll compare them side by side. So just um, to make sure you understand what kind of variables we are using, um, we decided to incorporate only six variables for this particular example. So we would be looking at the density, which is slightly tweaked. So rather than looking at the pure density, we would be looking at the, uh, the, the log of density. Uh, we decided that it uh, resembles the data much better. Mm, and it actually is reflected in the results, which could be much later. We would be looking at the bonus malus category, as well as some aggregated vehicle brands and the type of fuel. And so we would be looking at the regular and diesel, as well as some capped driver age and vehicle age. In terms of uh, machine learning, and as I mentioned, the set of explanatory variables are pretty much the same. So if we go to our um, GBM to see what task we're dealing with, we can see that we're dealing with a claim frequency regression task, where the evaluation metric would be the mean squared error. In the feature handling section, we can see that we are looking at pretty much the same variables. Uh, we introduced no interactions between them. We did not scale them. Uh, we did not perform any kind of feature selection. But what we did uh, is uh, in our training uh, procedure, we distinguish the best set of parameters and we've only trained our gradient boosting um, model on the best set of hyperparameters that you see on the right. So maybe right now it would be a good moment to see first what kind of results it deemed for the GBM in terms of our explainable AI charts that were introduced by Patrick in the first section. So in the top left corner, we see the setter is parable for driver age. And as, uh, as Patrick mentioned in his part, what we are looking at here at is actually a single observation. So uh, we would be looking at the driver age and let's, let's check the details of, of the observation that we've actually used. So are you looking at the bonus malus category 50, some kind of density of the place, uh, the driver age that we would be changing would be um, 52 for starting points, some vehicle age 13, uh, vehicle brand B10, and vehicle gas is diesel. And this uh, characteristics of our observation would be later on repeated for a chart such as breakdown, which you will see in a second as well. 
So what we see uh, straight away is uh, definitely a non-linearity within our data set. And going straight to the partial dependency, uh, which can be understood as the average of all the satirish variables uh, for a particular variable, we see that it pretty much resembles, um, our satirish variables resembles the full data set pretty okay. Um, but it slightly differs from the uh, from the partial dependency plot seen on the right. So you might think that uh, it, it actually makes sense. We've got our young drivers uh, who historically uh, contributes to slightly more um, claims than elder drivers. Then we see significant drop uh, when we get to age around 27, 25. Then the frequency slightly increases, and what it means it might be that our young our parents are giving their cars for, for our young drivers and we see that slight increase with the bump around the age of 40 and uh, 55 and then according to our model the claim frequency is pretty much flat for the other ages which uh, which stands a little bit in contrary to our partial dependency which says that for elder drivers the claim frequency increases uh, which i think uh, resembles the, the reality slightly better so going down to the bottom left corner, we see our breakdown charts. So again, we're looking at exactly the same uh, data points. And so we can pretty much say the same thing that Patrick has already mentioned. We can see that a bonus, a bonus malus category of 50 positively contributes to our prediction, uh, which might be a little bit confusing because it's depicted with red color. But what it actually means is that we are reducing our base level probability of uh, of contributing to a claim, uh, which is a good thing because it means that uh, on average this claim should occur less frequently for this particular driver. Vehicle age of 13 again is contributing also positively to our final prediction and the same thing uh, we can say about density in which this particular driver has registered the car. In contrary to that, the vehicle branch the B10 and the vehicle gas diesel and the driver age of 52 is actually increasing the probability of a claim occurring. Now we can have a look at the model agnostic variable importance, what it actually says, just to make it slightly larger so that you can see it also has this horizontal black line. And what it means is that our MAVI is actually being performed multiple times. And then the final result depicted on the chart is just the average of all those predictions. So I know it might be confusing, it was really confusing to me when I first saw this chart, but what we are looking at is this horizontal black line, which is our, our base, uh, base loss function value. And then we are looking at how the negative mean squared error is actually getting worse if we, if we change this, uh, this particular set of variables. So we can see that changes in the bonus malus variable are worsening um, worsening our final loss ratio as uh, way more significantly than all the other variables however the, the driver age the density um, and maybe the vehicle age and vehicle brand can also be deemed pretty significant the vehicle gas uh, seems not to impact the final loss function uh, as significantly as the other variables okay but this is the introduction about the uh, introduction to our results from the GBM but we want to what we want to look at is actually a comparison between the linear and nonlinear models. So maybe let's have a look at what it actually could look like in our particular example. So as I mentioned, we are only looking at the test data sets at the moment, and this is why we only see one set of statistics for both models. And uh, the first thing that we can say is that the Gini index is uh, significantly higher for the TBM model. This is 30, almost 30.33 30, compared to 0.26. And we can also see that our mean absolute error as well as mean squared error is lower for our TBM. It means at, at definitely at least uh, at the first glance that our GBM is a better model. But in order to make sure that it is the case, we should evaluate that by using other tools such as one-way predictive charts. And we can compare that against multiple variables included in the data sets. So first thing that we can look at is the vehicle brand. 
and that straight away we can see that actually none of the models is predicting very well. Um, we can see that there are some outliers and the, the prediction is actually exceeding the confidence interval uh, for, both, uh, for both types of models, which means that maybe there are some particular um, features of both GLM and GBM where we could actually make some kind of improvements. And uh, in contrary to that, we cannot really say that about driver age, which is very well predicted by our GBM and is pretty well predicted by the GLM. However, GLM uh, is not predicting very well for the younger drivers as well as for the elder drivers. We can say that probably on average, we are predicting pretty okay in this medium ranges. Uh, but looking at the, the GBM chart, we can see that it predicts uh, much better. We can even consider some kind of overfit, but uh, that should not be the case in here. In here, we, uh, for the elder drivers, we might consider some, some binning or, or further cupping of the variable or actually uncupping of the variable, because we can see that for the lower profile count, uh, we are actually quite far off uh, from the target uh, when it comes to target versus predicted values. So for another this time categorical variable such as area, we can see that again our GBM is performing much better than our linear model, which again um, gives us more confidence that our GBM is actually a better model than our GLM. And going down uh, to look at the density variable, you might remember that we've actually decided to use the, the log of density in, in both models, in both uh, GBM and GLM. And uh, as you can see, it is pretty much um, justified, our choice is pretty much justified when we see um, the target variable. We can see that it changes slightly in a logarithmic way, but then uh, for this lower profile counts, we can see that we are again going outside of the confidence interval, which means that we are not aligning to our data sets uh, very well. This is also the case for the GBM, uh, for the lower profile counts, as well as uh, for the medium range uh, profit counts, which means that maybe GBM is also not predicting um, the density very, very well. Going further down, we can have a look side by side at something that probably is the most in in interesting thing to you guys, which is a direct comparison of our explainable AI charts uh, introduced by Patrick and comparison side by side between the, the GLM and GBM. So you can see a funny thing that GLM is actually, we've definitely used some kind of spline techniques. Um, however, this spline seems to be pretty weird. We're, we're predicting uh, one function that is a decreasing function um, up to the driver age of 25, and then our prediction is pretty much flat for all the other driver ages, which means that potentially, there is some kind of a different spline technique or maybe uh, instead of doing a spline we should introduce a formula uh, with the driver age that would uh, allow us to uh, to fit into um, this particular variable a little bit better for the satirish variables charts and uh, i think you should be pretty familiar by now with this chart because we've seen that in the in this first dashboard that i've introduced to you um but it definitely makes more sense at least uh, Combining that with the historical information about the, the claim frequency of the MTPL products that we've got, uh, we know that this kind of shape of so there is variables or partial dependency makes significantly more sense than the thing that we see on the left. When it comes to our partial dependency, again, it's important to remember that we've used the log of density in our uh, in our GLM, and this is why the, the partial dependency function is in a logarithmic shape. However, We've also used the log of density in our GBM, and as you can see, the partial dependency is not really that kind, that logarithmic, or at least not as logarithmic as the partial dependency for the linear models. So we, we can observe some nonlinearity and significant bumps um, for the density such as 5K and then around 10K. So it's fluctuating around this logarithmic shape, but it's not really exactly logarithmic. Then when we have a look at the model agnostic variable importance, we see that they pretty much uh, align uh, between each other. 
So maybe uh, the MAVI for GBM is putting slightly more emphasis on the driver age than the, uh, oh, pardon me, um, I was, I was I've misread the, the variable. So the, the differences are actually significant. So we can have a look that the, for the GLM uh, density is, um, is by far the second most important variable, or at least the second uh, most contributing to our final prediction variable. Uh, whereas uh, for the GBM, it was actually on third place. However, the driver age, which is the second most important feature for our GBM, is actually deemed to be the least important um, or least contributing to the final GLM prediction, which is pretty interesting. And uh, when we go down and have a look at the GLM, um, it's actually exactly the same as uh, with the Mavi charts. Because if we look at the driver age, uh, the driver age is 52, and we can see that it uh, contributes negatively to the final prediction for the GBM, whereas it is pretty much neutral for the prediction of the GLM function. Uh, we can see that the density is pretty much uh, alike for both of the models. However, um, uh, yeah, however, the density and vehicle age are pretty much alike. Um, however, the, uh, the driver age is a significant differentiator between those two models. So yeah, I think this is the end of my part as well, and we can go back to Slido. So I'll go, uh, I'll start I'll stop sharing the screen and give the voice back to Patrick. Okay, so maybe um, before before this, we go back another to uh, another question on on Slido, which you which you should now uh, now see. Uh, if if you Patrick, maybe if you can switch to to the to the Slido. Um, and basically, the question about it around this is um, if uh, your current pricing tool uh, supports. Any ex, uh, explainable AI method, so either either all of those that we that we have mentioned, or or uh, at least some that 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 you that you know of. And uh, while you're answering, we had a we had a uh, one question in the in the Q and A, which maybe uh, Patrick and Mikola you can answer in in the meantime. And uh, if you had to choose one explainable AI method, which one, which one would it be? And please don't say it depends. Uh, so, but Patrick, I will uh, to give Mikolai some some break for, for from speaking. I will I will give the words to you. Do you want to start, Patrick, or do you, do you want me to start? Okay, I can I can go ahead. Um, so unfortunately for me, it depends because uh, it depends what your goal actually is. If you want to explain the final prediction regardless of, uh, of a particular variable that you're currently looking at, then probably some kind of data sets, uh, level XI charts would be helpful. I really like the breakdown of prediction or a similar to breakdown of prediction, you can have a look at sharp values, for example. You might be familiar with from the uh, Shapley values from game theory. And I know that uh, Sharp package is commonly used, uh, especially in um, in R and Python world of data scientists. And for me, those kind of breakdown of prediction charts are very easy to understand. And uh, yeah, this is my go-to method probably. But if I was looking at the particular variable and how this particular variable contributes to the final um, final prediction, I would probably be looking at the partial dependency chart. Patrick, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, to me, also, it depends on type of question, which is otherwise all I want to answer to. Uh, so, uh, but basically, I would like to start with some uh, some RMSE or mean squared error and Sharpie uh, indicator, as much you said at the beginning, and then uh, maybe some uh, the most robust techniques such as Mavi. And then I'm setting uh, further and further uh, if I want to explore some uh, outliers or some really problematic segments of drivers. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for both both for answering. And uh, maybe I also, uh, for, for me, I would also say it depends, unfortunately, but I would say then on, on a different uh, different level than, uh, than Patio and Mikolai. For me, it depends also who I'm maybe explaining this this to, because, for example, the, for me, the breakdown methods is, is something that basically anyone can can understand on the uh, on, on on the first first glance. Whereas if we go to uh, to the to the other methods like uh, Ceteris Paribus, for me, then it's more difficult to actually explain. To someone, what what they what they are what they are looking at, it, it takes it takes some time. So for me, it would also depend on on the on the person who uh, who I'm speaking to. But personally, for me, again, the for me the breakdown is is probably the the for me the easiest to understand and easier easiest to take take something away uh, quickly. Uh, Okay, so uh, if we jump back to the uh, to the to the presentation, so um, hopefully, what what we basically uh, convinced you, or at least uh, in the past thirty minutes, is that uh, there are some there are some methods that that could that could help you uh, with with usage of of nonlinear models of these so called black uh, black black boxes, and uh, let's say apart from you actually maybe learning or or having a deeper understanding after today what 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 these what these methods are, uh, or at least a a overview so that you can that you can start digging into them. Uh, what what we would like to basically put on the table as a takeaway at least for for us is. Uh, that at the moment we are not proposing a a full switch to from from your uh, from your existing existing pricing models to for example some kind of uh, nonlinear nonlinear models, uh, but what we are rather thinking is that this should be some kind of a uh, of a step stepwise approach. So start start investigating the the nonlinear models, uh, understand where they possibly can have uh, can have a uh, a better predictions than than uh, linear one, uh, and also then start using uh, this this explainable AI one to to get an understanding into of, into the uh, into the nonlinear models. So for for its let's say most intended purposes, but also you can you can start using explainable AI as uh, as a feedback loop to into your traditional uh, traditional models, uh, for example, in like in um, variable uh, variable selections, where where uh, for example something like GLM is is not very capable to work with with a lot of lot of lot of variables, whereas for these uh, for these nonlinear nonlinear methods, this is usually not the problem. And then again. Explainable AI could help you with, with seeing which from the which which of the variables are uh, are contributing, and you can you can maybe check to see if these if these variables are would then bring something into the back into the into the linear model, maybe something that you didn't spot before. And uh, also, uh, I think that using explainable AI can help you to. Uh, maybe spot some trends in in the data, maybe some segments in in the data which where you where the uh, linear models are maybe again not not performing so well. Maybe where you could have some more aggressive uh, aggressive uh, aggressive pricing uh, aggressive pricing strategy. So uh, explainable AI, I think in in our in our uh, opinion. Does not need to only be used to uh, to understand uh, to understand the the nonlinear models, but they can also help you with um, maybe some some uh, improvement in your uh, in your existing uh, existing pricing models. And for the uh, for the last poll question, I would again ask uh, ask Patio to switch over to uh, to Slido. And we have we have the last last question 
uh, that if you uh, if you think that uh, utilizing the machine learning methods or nonlinear nonlinear models uh, combined with with explainable AI uh, would uh, would improve would improve your your uh, your pricing. And uh, in the in the meantime, I will go back to the to the answers of the of the previous uh, previous questions. Uh, the first question was that if you think that the theoretical methods would would improve the usage of black box models within your company, there we had like over two thirds answering answering yes, and around one third of of you answering that uh, no, that you don't think that's that's the case. Uh, for the second second question, uh, which was which was if if uh, your existing uh, pricing tool uh, supports explainable AI uh, methods. 25% uh, of you answered that uh, yeah, that it's supported. 38% uh, answered that uh, no, that it's that it's not supported. And 38% uh, answered that uh, you do not know if, if the explainable methods are, are in the uh, in the pricing tool. And for this for this last last question uh, for this last question, most of you think that, or all of you think that, uh, all of you who, who participated think that this this would bring would bring value into into your pricing process. So uh, that's that's it for the for the for the webinar. Um, we would like to thank you for for the attention. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Mikolai, for for uh, presenting. We we hoped you uh, you learned uh, something new today. Uh, you you're taking some of the takeaway away away with you. And uh, if you if you're interested in in discussing uh, discussing these these topic more, I think that. Uh, all of us are are very happy to, uh, to to discuss, even to brainstorm, as as we think that this is a this is a fun fun topic to to work on. So again, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.